very uh, relevant for us, which is uh, the social embeddedness of uh, economic decisions. Um, he's from the he's doing his PhD in the Department of Sociology, uh, and uh, I I know that he has prepared a, a wonderful presentation for you today. So uh, here is it. Thank you. So what I want to do today essentially is to explain to you what the role of relationships understood more broadly the role of relationships in economic life the basic arguments i want to go over with you are i want to convince you today that economic behavior is not this isolated transactional sets of some transactions that can be modeled using sophisticated mathematical models that assume make certain assumptions about actors. What I want to tell you, what I want to convince you about, is that um, economic behaviors are based on relationships. Relationships between buyer and seller, between one firm and another firm, between a state and consumers, between a state and companies. Not only that, but I want to show you that the type of relationships that people have right, affect their economic behaviors in relatively predictable ways. Now, when I say predictable ways, I don't mean as predicted by neoclassical economic models. I want to say predictable in the sociological sense. We have theories that relate different forms of relationship between individuals and firms and countries to specific economic outcomes. It is possible to empirically, empirically, uh, study and model the impact of relationships on economic life. I'll show you how um, towards the end of my presentation. So, neoclassical economics. You know, I know I'm kind of erecting a straw man here. Neoclassical econ economics has moved a little bit since the 70s and 80s and the heyday of the Chicago School. But essentially, the basic model of neoclassical economics is what you see in this picture. Two merchants transacting, they probably don't know each other, they'll never see each other again, they've never seen each other before. The guy on the left, probably buying a lemon or a banana, whatever that is, possibly bargaining with this salesperson, with this merchant, they decide on a price and they exchange. And that is essentially the model, the, the, the paradigm of neoclassical economic processes. Two people, who are self-interested, right? They want utility, they want to achieve a certain idea of utility for themselves, some kind of, through the transaction. They are rationalists, they constantly make calculations, and is this product good for me? Am I willing to pay this price? Is he or she offering me uh, good compensation for my product? What they wanna do is obviously maximize their utility, and importantly, they are monads. So what do we mean by monads? It means that uh, neoclassical economists consider actors in, a, in, in an economic transaction to be devoid of any kind of ulterior relationships in the wider world. They assume that they were basically just came into being in the world and boom, were launched into an exchange situation and have all the cognitive and uh, rational skills to evaluate whether the transaction they're being offered is a good one or a bad, or a bad one. What's the problem with, neoclassical, with the neoclassical model of actorhood? Well, one problem is that it ignores the idea that people have social roles, right? So people may belong to a certain religion. They might be part of a certain subculture. They may be Goths or vegans. Um, they may be Jewish or Muslim. Certainly all these kind of positions that people have in society should affect the way they transact economically. Just to give you the simplest examples, uh, religious Jews don't do anything on Saturday. They just close their shops. There's no way, you know, the, it's, it's considered a sin to, um, to work uh, or to open your shop or to buy anything on a Saturday, on the Sabbath. Surely that is just one example of a deviation from the market-oriented, ultra-rational, value-maximizing monad uh, predicated um, that, that is espoused by neoclassical economists. Now, the second problem with the neoclassical model is that it ignores relationships. 
right? So when I transact with someone, first of all, I may have a relationship with that someone. You know, I might, hey, you know, like maybe I have to, I don't really want to hire this guy. It wouldn't be the rational thing to do for my business, but hey, his dad is my friend, so what the hell, why not? Okay, moreover, it's not just the relationship I have with the person in front in front of me that affect how I will transact with them and what kind of economic behaviors I will assume. It's also my relationships outside the market situation. So in the previous example, right? So the guy with the bag looks like a tourist, you know, his purchasing decision is probably based on the fact that he has some kind of family. He wants to buy them trinkets or maybe he has a baby. He wants that, that he wants to buy a, you know, a banana for. All these kind of ulterior network relationships, the, 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 the map of relationships that each one of us have directly affect our economic behaviors in ways not predicted by neoclassical economic models. Right, so having gone through the problems, let's kind of summarize what I'm, like the first part of my argument. What I'm saying is that neoclassical economics, this is how they see the world. Two people transact, thinking of prices, saying prices, bargaining, calculating the utility function, each their respective utility functions and making some kind of decision. Sociology looks at the bigger picture. It looks at this, right? People have different colors, different social roles, different identities, right? They have relationships, you know, the, the, the signs here represent the kind of relationships they have. Their relationships are not just monetary, they're not just transactional, market-based. They may be enemies, they may be in love, they may be in, this, they may be in the same band with each other, they may have be part of the same eating club, they may go to synagogue or to a church together. All of these things will impact how these two people <laughs> transact in a given situation. Now, when I say two people, I mean two actors. So it can be two companies, two countries, two unions. Um, the individuals you see here are you know, represented as people just for simplicity's sake. Now, I'm not inventing the wheel here, right? So the study of relationships and it's important for social science is not something new. In fact, every social science features ha will has Strong em puts strong emphasis on relationships and their role uh, in some way. In so you see this in psychology, in criminology, in anthropology, and of course in sociology. I've kind of listed the different um, specializations or examples of uh, subfields where relationships are a central component of analysis and theorizing. So probably the most, for our purposes, what you'll be most interested in is the subfield of sociology called economic sociology, which is essentially economics, but from a sociological perspective. Economics, which allows for the role impact of institutions, of relationships, of irrational behaviors, um, of things that cannot just be modeled mathematically and on the basis of you know, rational monadistic assumptions about actors. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And this is how uh, the rest of this lecture will go about. I'll give you examples of different fields where an understanding of relationships is crucial. Labor market outcomes, right? How do, you know, let's ask a simple question. How do people get jobs? The new classical model says, well, you know, there's demand for human capital. A company needs certain skills. It needs certain, it needs people who have the ability to perform certain tasks. Meanwhile, there is some kind of supply of individuals on the labor market that can do these things and based on the relative demand for human capital, supply for hu and, and, su and supply of that human capital, um, there is some kind of wage bargaining that takes place whereby the company decides to pay a worker the wage that is equivalent, that is equiv as long as it's a wage that is bigger than the marginal return on revenue, something like that. Those of you who are economists know what I'm talking about. The idea is a worker cannot be more expensive than the revenue that he or she brings to the company. Now, look at assumption number three. That's a crucial, that's a crucial kind of meta, a crucial meta critique of neoclassical economics is the assumption of perfect information. All the workers who need a certain skill know all, the, uh, who have a certain skill are aware of all the uh, companies or firms or employers that need that skill. 
right? There's no, the idea that, you know, it, that, that, that if you live in a um, isolated neighborhood, in a poor area of the country, you might not even be aware of all the different places that require your skill, that doesn't come in, in new classical economics, especially the old variety. Now I know that, mod that new classical models compensate for that. Um, but you should be aware that this is the basic structure of, um, you know, the job finding process in uh, new classical economics. However, economic sociologists have long showed us, have long known that it's actually who you know that counts, if not more than at least as much as, you know, your skills and education. Take a study by uh, Nan Dirk de Graaf from 1988. It's a foundational study. There's been many replications since, but I'm showing you, you know, one of the earlier ones that kind of pointed this out. It found that 30% of uh, job seekers in the Netherlands, 40% in Germany, and 60% in the United States found a job through personal contacts, right? Not through job adverts, not through LinkedIn, um, not by going to the employment agency, through personal contacts. Okay, you may all be aware of this, but let's, let's, you know, let's get you active a little bit. I want you to participate with me in a small exercise. Who do you think are the most important job contacts uh, in the job finding process? Parents. Parents. L let me give you three options, okay? Let's, let's not think of social roles. Let's think of how often you see them, right? Are the most important people who, who will find you your job, are they the ones you meet often? So two plus times a week. So parents would go into this, close friends, siblings, um, maybe your teacher, I don't know, something like that. Is it those you meet rarely, so less than once a year? So rarely would be, I don't know, some distant second cousin, your friends from elementary school, etc. And Or those you meet sometimes, so that's basically in between the two. So friends who you meet sort of on a, week, on a weekly basis, more distant friends you meet once a month, friends from back home. Okay. So who, th okay, so think about this for five seconds and then we'll have a show of hands. Which one of these contact categories is most likely to find your job, right? And this is, I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you, this is the actual percentages um, of people, like what people actually said, but I won't tell you which one belongs to which. So who thinks, that the people most likely to find you a job are those you meet um, rarely, so less than uh, once a year. Okay, Nicole, nice one, brave. Uh, who thinks it's the people you meet often? So the people you meet twi two, two or more times a week. Okay, yes, you said parents, that's right. Who thinks it's the people you meet sometimes? So, okay, so basically every, everyone else. Second question, who is more likely to find you a job? The people you meet rarely or the people you meet often? Who thinks often? Okay, who thinks rarely? All right. Well, you guys are actually quite better than I expected because yes, the people you meet often are the smallest category of people who find you jobs. The people you meet Rarely, the second, small, second smallest, and the people you meet sometimes are, account for more than half of all job finding uh, successes. Why is that? What's, what's going on? Basically, people you meet every once in a while, not too often, are called weak ties in sociological theory. These are people, you know, you find, you know, you, you're, you're not very close to them. You meet occasionally, you exchange information. They're not your best friends. These are people who are probably embedded in different networks to your own. And therefore, they, they have the information about opportunities that you may not have. On the other hand, people like your family members, your teacher, your very best friends, they're your strong ties. They all know each other. They go to the same places as you. That's why you see them all the time. They are not aware of anything that you're not aware of. They have the same horizon of awareness of opportunities that you have. So they're very useful for giving you emotional support, for being your best friends, for lending, lending a uh, empathetic ear to your troubles, for helping you paint your house, but they're not very useful for letting you know about new opportunities, right? So here you have it, just an example of how 
a systematic study of relationships can alert us to counterintuitive, some, somewhat counterintuitive results of economic processes. Now, relationship, now this is not just like me sitting in an ivory tower and, and saying this to you. This, the, what I've just described to you has long been sort of, um, has been known by industry, you know, industry firms, by companies who have successively shown that uh, employee referrals, right? So firms find that the highest, the best source for employee, for um, uh, job recruitment are their own employees who go out and recommend their friends or people they know to their boss who then hires whoever it is. Here's another example. So it's just from different kind of in internet, internet job finding firms that um, I found on the internet, right? So 48% employee referrals. Example number two. Innovation, one of, one of those elusive things no one can't quite get his or her head around. How does it happen? What is the magic, magical formula? Well, in economics, it's a, you know, ec economists are a little bit behind on this. Sociologists have already taken steps to identify how relationships help predict who will be innovative and who will not. Now, the lesson I'll, t I'll teach you here is the most important thing are bridges, and we'll see why. I wanna play a small game with you, okay? But first, I'll introduce you the study upon which this game is based. So Bert in 2004 wrote a seminal article, kind of foundational article, about a huge, you know, thousands of employees, big electric company, which he, he wouldn't say which one, probably General Electric, where he asked managers um, he interviewed all supply chain managers in the company and asked them and you know asked three things first Who do you discuss your ideas with which other supply chain managers? Do you discuss your ideas with right? He wrote it all down Then he asked them Write down your best improvement suggestion for the firm. Just you know take an hour sit down Paragraph two paragraphs three paragraphs just write them down and you know we'll have them evaluated by someone high up in the firm. Okay, so they all sat down. He did this with, hun with hundreds and hundreds of employees in that specific firm. He then went on to check each manager's salaries, promotion history, right, and personal evaluations. So the evaluations that each manager got from, um, from his or her uh, superior. Okay, R did a few regressions, checked a few things. Let's see if you can guess. Um, who the best managers were, the most innovative, the best paid, the best promoted, right? To do this, I'll show you the visual, net, the visual network map of that company, right? Each number represents a manager, right? There's no significance to the actual magnitude of the number. It's just like a, yeah, nominal. Each link, right, represents, um, connects two people, two managers who discuss their ideas together. Right, so 234 discusses his or her ideas with 183, with 438, 336, with 541, with number nine, etc. Right, now each of these sort of clusters, as we call them in social network analysis, represent different departments, right? And naturally, you'll see that clusters have more dense structures of relationship between the managers because they see each other all the time, they probably do the same thing, they do the same region, whatever. Okay, now, the crown above goes to the best manager. Who do you think, which kind of manager, which of these three managers is the prototypical, ideal, most innovative, best promoted, best paid, best evaluation receiving manager in that specific uh, electrics firm? Who thinks it's manager 593? Why not? I'm sure you have a reason because you can't all be, unless you've all coordinated this. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and what does that mean? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, makes sense. Who thinks uh, it's uh, 205? Yeah, okay. Why?
Right, so he has the most links, he's kind of, he gets the most ideas. You're saying something like that, okay, or he's, okay, good. Any, any other reasons? Okay, who thinks it's uh, 592? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, interesting. So let's see who the crown goes to. It goes to, no, sorry, it goes to 592. <laughs> Anyone, um, anyone can figure out why? Yes. So he's getting ideas from outside his own little bubble, isn't he? Precisely. 592 is what we would call a, what, what Bert calls a network broker, right? He's, on this strate he's in this strategic position in the network of the company whereby he, has, he gets ideas both from his own cluster of people who work with him as well as Completely novel ideas, outlandish things that these guys would never think about because all they do is talk to each other, right? So he gets ideas originating from one who is embedded in a completely different cluster, who probably see things differently, who have a different way of thinking about things, right? Based on this logic, number nine is probably a very successful manager because he, you know, he's a bridge to all these other clusters out there. So is number 25. Now, just to give you an, now, just to give you an idea of how much one's bridging position affects um, economic, like affects one's performance. Here are just some graphs, sorry to bore you with this, but x-axis represents the degree of constraint. So basically the closer you are to 100, the more constrained you are inside a cluster and the less of a bridging kind of manager you are. So here you see salaries go down the more constrained you are. The probability of receiving a poor evaluation for your superiors goes up the more constrained you are while the probability of getting an outstanding evaluation goes down quite sharply. Uh, the less of a bridge you are and the more you're kind of stuck inside this dense cluster relationship. And the probability of promotion or getting a raise are even more sharply negative, in inversely related to one's bridging position. Um, the quality of suggestions, remember I said that he asked, Bert asked the managers to write their best ideas. Well, their best ideas were submitted to two double blind executive managers of the company who evaluated each idea and they both and in both cases you saw a very clear negative association between the degree to which one is constrained and the quality of the idea well that's an inch now this this result has been replicated right and it's 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 a classical result of uh, economic sociology and it gives you an idea of how exactly of how one's position in a network in a network of relationships uh, affects macro outcomes at the firm level, sort of firm level outcomes in terms of you know, performance, em employee performance, innovation, etc. There's other examples of this, just to name a few. Silicon Valley, why is Silicon Valley such a thing? Why is there a Cambridge uh, technological hub? Because companies want to be close to each other so that they can create more easily these bridges which allow ideas to flow from one company to the other. Same thing happens with um, corporate interlocks. Um, a conspiracy theorist might be tempted to say that the reason the Bush administration did not just let all the banks fail and you know, nationalize them and then reprivatize them without all the greedy bankers, uh, the reason for that was that um, Goldman Sachs and other bankers acted as bridges between the financial sector and the administration. We all know that Trump's administration, as well as George Bush's, as well as Obama's administration, were, were full of um, Goldman Sachs and other high-level CEO bankers who would have probably done everything they could to not have the uh, US government uh, allow the banking sector to you know, fail. Um, so that's the origins of the too big to fail, just, just an idea. And of course, social media, if you want to understand how virality works, virality works when someone who is a bridge receives your message, thinks it's cool, sends it to a completely different network, and that's what causes the kind of viral information flows. Next example. Our last example um, for today, um, Jews in the global diamond trade, right? I don't know if you, how much you're aware of how the diamond market works, but what I want to do is discuss a little bit economics at the market level, looking at the whole global market and how it works. A basic primer, um, diamonds are mined in Africa and a few other places. They get to wholesalers who then sell them to merchants, um, merchants process them, sell them to retailers who sell them to consumers, right? These are the three most diamond sales in the world take place in these three 
cities, right? Tel Aviv, Antwerp in Belgium, and New York City, with um, New York being especially prominent for retail sales. Most transactions involve credit, right? People give diamonds and receive payment later. Why? Because most consumers buy diamonds in November, December, close to Christmas, whereas, you know, um, the merchants, retailers, wholesalers need to, they, they work all the time. Um, consume, the retailers cannot pay, um, they, they can only pay for the diamonds that they purchase from merchants at the end of the year, once they've made all their sales. Okay. Um, there's very little documentation involved in uh, diamond sales, right? So a lot of it is informal, and it's relatively easy to cheat. Let's see why soon. So last ex I think last exercise for the day. Imagine the following business proposal, right? Some, some guy comes to you and says, give me your $200,000 diamond, okay? I'll pay you in one year. Okay, fair enough. But, he adds, no collateral, no advance payment. Oh, and just one last thing, you cannot sue me in court. Okay, that's, that's the business proposal. Would we have a market under these circumstances? Do we have a deal? What would the neoclassical economists say? Anyone venture a guess? Deal or no deal? No way. No way. Why? Um, because it's, it's completely irrational. You, you, you would never, you would never uh, do that to normally, particularly if it's a sales of products like that, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> So the neoclassical economist, well, well put, um, says what? No guarantees, unenforceable contract, what the hell? Way too high risk, irrational, no deal, mister. But the diamond traders in Antwerp, New York City, and Tel Aviv, they'll say, mm, yes, we have a deal. What? How is that possible? That completely contradicts the whole rationality basis of you know, neoclassical models. How can we explain this? The question we should ask really is, you know, if there's no collateral and there's no advance payment and I cannot see you in court, then surely there's something between us that makes me sure that you'll respect our, you know, advance deal, our credit deal. What is this thing? I something you. I trust you. Exactly. What is the source of this trust? How can people agree? And, 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 and the sums I was giving you are not exaggerated at all. Like, I've, I, I've been to the Antwerp uh, Diamond Exchange, and it's funny. You sit next to a guy, you tell him, hey, can you show me this from Random Diamonds? He takes a, a bag made from, like, the cheapest paper, just throws it at you, goes like this. I ask him, how much is each diamond wor worth? He says to me, yeah, 20,000, 30,000, you know, small pieces like this. Then he went, made him some soft tea. I could have just taken the whole thing, put it in my pocket, and run away, you know, bought myself a nice, a, like, three cars. Apparently, there's a lot of trust going on there. And um, the question is, where does this trust come from? What is it predicated on? Because that's not the kind of situation that get, begets markets in the economic neoclassical sense. Well, here's a hint. Anyone wants to, get, wants to guess what the hint is? No, going once, going twice, okay. The hint is that 90% of New York's diamond traders are Jewish, right? The same in Antwerp, the same in Tel Aviv, right? Especially Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews. So not, not Jews like, you know, the secular assimilated Jews, but these, these types of guys, right? That's the hint. Now, Richmond in 2006 went to New York City and conducted an anthropological study of the diamond uh, market to try and understand the source of trust. And he came up with this. I'm simplifying, right? He has a much more elaborate argument, but he came out with the following model. He noticed, first of all, New York City Jews Orthodox Jews especially, all know each other. They're married between each other. They have lots of children who also marry other ultra-Orthodox uh, friends' children. Um, their families all go to the same kihilot. Kihilot is like the Jewish version of congregation, right? So they go to the same synagogue. They belong to the same kind of communal Jewish organizations. Um, these are very dense communities that spend a lot of time with each other. Everyone knows each other. Everyone marries each other. Um, and importantly, um, one's own reputation in that community, one's own status in the community, depends very much on one's family reputation. So if your grandfather was a big rabbi, then people will know this and say, oh, he's probably something special. 
Um, if your father was a big, was a rich donor to the Jewish community of New York City, people will say, oh, that's, you know, yes, let's, let's get him into the nice school or let's let him read the first prayer this Sabbath, etc., etc. Right? So family reputation gives you as an individual in the family the same reputation and uh, with reputation come perks. Right? So like I said, admission to the best schools, to the best yeshivot, specific, certain rights at prayer. You get better marriage uh, proposals if, you, if your family is a high status, reputable family. Now, what does that mean? The first thing this model means, just if you process that, think about what that means, how that changes the whole logic of Jewish diamond traders. The first thing it means is that um, entry to the market, to the diamond market, is based on family reputation, right? So given that we need to trade in credit, right, and you don't know me, how would you know whether I'm reliable? Well, if you know my family, if you've heard of my, sister, my, my brother, my father, my grandfather, sure, that is already a signal of my own reliability as um, a merchant or um, as a retailer of diamonds. And I should add here that the diamond business is a father to son kind of business. Okay, so it's not, um, it's, um, it's very, it's usually the, the, the um, merchants and retailers, um, you know, follow their fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers footsteps, right? So one comes into this market with a, rep with a pre-established family based reputation um, that is known to everyone because everyone is in the Jewish community and everyone has heard of everyone. It also means that if you're not an Orthodox Jew trying to enter the market, you won't get business. Who are you? I don't know you. Are you, you know, like if, if say you're not Jewish, say you're, I don't know, um, Hindu or Christian, no one knows you. There's no signal about you. There's no trust. There's no signal of trust. But it's not just that people don't, it's not, it's not just that people don't know um, about you or your family. It's also the specific way that the logic of reputation within the Jewish community that ensures that everyone acts, th that no one cheats. Why is that? Because if you cheat, you're unreliable. You bring shame on your family, not just on yourself. Remember what I said? People's reputations are based on their families, but it also goes the other around. If you have a rotten apple, the whole family is shamed, right? If, if you have, if you and two of your siblings are diamond traders and you cheat, they will lose business too, because people say, mm, I'd rather not take the risk. We already know they have one rotten apple in that family. I'd rather not trade with the other two. Not to mention, you know, the same goes for your father, your uncles, everyone. If you cheat and you're branded as a cheater, moreover, um, people who transact with you nevertheless also lose reputation. Right? So there's this kind of coordinated enforcement mechanism within the Jewish community based on reputation and based on the fact that cheating affects your family and it affects the community status of the, the status of the family inside the entire co Jewish community. What does that mean? It means that if you cheat, your family is shamed, it loses business, and not only does it lose business, it also loses a lot of the perks it has outside the exchange situation. So, you know, if your brother or your cousin used to always get dibs on reading the first, the Sabbath prayer on, on, in, on, on Saturday at the synagogue, no more. If your cousin was hoping to get admitted into the best yeshiva, so yeshiva is like a, it's like a ultra, ultra orthodox religious schools where they study the Talmud and the Bible, things like that. If you were hope, if your cousin was hoping to get into the best school, the best yeshiva, no, no longer happening. If your sister was hoping that her family reputation would al allow her to obtain a favorable high status marriage, that's also not happening. So the cost of cheating basically for the individual is much greater than just being receiving no business or being ostracized him or herself from the diamond market. The cost is community wide. You lose your entire status in all of the networks in which you're embedded, right? A neoclassical economist would say, oh, well, all that matters is the transaction between the Jewish diamond retailer and the Jewish diamond merchant and that's it. What economic sociologists are saying, no, 
look at other relationships, look at who, look at whether these people are connected to each other in other ways, because other ways will mean that there are other enforcement mechanisms that are not necessarily market-based. So what do actually Jewish relationships do in this situation? Let's formalize all of this. Let's kind of boil this down to the three basic components. One thing they do is they define norms, the norms amongst Jewish diamond traders and in, in, in the Jewish community in general is, hey, be honest, don't cheat. We do things by honesty. You can, I'll give you credit, I'll let you have my diamonds, and I trust you that you will pay me on schedule in you know, half a year's time. It's okay, no need to sign any paper. It's between us. They define sanctions. The relationships embed sanctions between individuals. What are the sanctions in this case? If you cheat, your reputation is gone, you'll have no business, and your family is ostracized from the community, or is punished, let's put it that way. Your entire family loses status, right? It's very nice to define norms, but if you don't have sanctions, you have no mechanism for ensuring that these norms are actually adhered to. And these sanctions are also part of the kind of relational structure of the Orthodox Jewish community of New York and Antwerp. Finally, you need to have a monitoring mechanism. So relationships need to somehow contain within them a way of monitoring compliance and uncompliance. What is the monitoring mechanism in this case? It's the fact that everyone knows each other, right? The Jewish diamond traders all know each other from their congregations, from their families, from the, all the marriages that they're somehow linked to each other. So the moment you cheat, within 24 hours, everyone knows about it. You know, the guy you cheated will say it to his cousin, will say it to his uncle, will say it to a friend. It will spread very, very fast. There's no way, you know, in this sense, in this specific sense, the market is, um, people have perfect information, <laughs> right? In the neoclassical sense, because they're all so densely linked to each other. All of these things together mean that um, Jews, Jewish communities, the Jewish diamond trade in New York City, in Antwerp, in Israel, um, they're based on enforceable trust, right? Relationships, the type of relationships, the structure, the characteristics of relationships between Jewish diamond traders um, is one that ensures that there's enforceable trust that is autonomous from the state. They don't need the state. No Jew ever sues each other. They, they, they very rarely sue each other in court. Right? Everything is dealt within the community because the community and its relationships ensure that you know, the sanctions are there, the monitoring is there, and the perks are there for those who do comply with the norm of uh, honestly. So again, relationships, very, very, very important. Now, let's go back to the thing I, let's go back to the uh, diagram I showed you before, right? Our last exercise for the day. This time, this time I think I'm serious. Um, only this time numbers, right, refer to diamond traders, not to managers. And the vertices refers to who knows each other. Again, who know each other. Identify who do you think would be the best diamond trader, the diamond trader who's most likely to get business, who's most likely to uh, have credit, who, who, whose promise of future payment is most likely to be believed or accepted. This is to see if, you've if, if, if I'm getting through. Is it 592? Hands, no, no show of hands. Okay, yes, one, good. Is it 593? Why not? Why would Diamond Trader 593, who knows no one, not receiving any business? Yes? That's right. Every link here represents someone knowing someone else. No one knows him. Why would they, why would he, why would they let him buy stuff from them on credit? They don't know him. He's an outsider, he or she. What about 205? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, this time you're correct. So, um, <laughs> yes, this dense cluster of relationship is probably what the, Jew the Jewish diamond trade, the Jewish diamond market looks like. Everyone knows each other, right? People are densely interconnected, and it's this way of visualizing the market that allows you to understand why monitoring is so easy. If he cheats, he knows about it, he knows about it, he knows about it, he knows about it, he knows about it. He kno everyone knows about it because everyone is linked to everyone. And in this specific market, in this specific economic situation, this guy's position is actually not that spectacular, right? He's not sufficiently part of any kind of dense community to be able to 
receive the kind of trust that you need to be able to transact in the diamond market. So let's bring this together um, in the final stage, just to kind of give you an idea of how we analyze social networks, right? So this is a typical social network. I already showed you, you know, structural hole is a gap between two clusters. <coughs> no. Every circle we call, we, call, we call each circle in a network diagram a node, so it can be a person, an organization, it can be a country, whatever economic actor you're looking at. A link can be any sort of relationship that links nodes together. So it can be nodes, you know, it can be X knows Y, it can be X married to Y, X works for Y, um, it can be X is a friends with Y, X is a customer of Y, whatever, whatever suits your purpose. And, you know, when you have dense, like several nodes densely interconnected, you get a cluster. Right? And clusters, as we just saw with the, in the, with the example of the diamond market, clusters are characterized by high density relationships, lots of trust and reciprocity, right? because they all know each other and they probably hang, hang together quite, uh, quite often, H hang out together quite often. Easy enforcement of norms, and, uh, of norms. Usually there's some kind of shared identity because why would you be so densely interconnected with all these people if you're not part of some kind of similar identity community? And examples of this are obviously the Jewish community, a village, uh, the aristocracy in this country. I'm pretty sure they're all densely interconnected and they all know each other quite well. There's not that many of them anyway. The guy in the middle here, he's a network switcher. So I said broker. Broker is the term used by Bert. Most people use network switcher. Network switchers are the nodes that are usually typically responsible for information flows, right? So all the information contained here needs to pass through this person or this company or this actor to reach anyone in here, right? That's why bridging nodes or network switchers are so important for information flows in a wider community, um, in, in a wider network. Uh, you'll typically find that the people responsible for community mobilization, for protest, for revolutions, uh, the, the crucial actors in these processes are network switchers because they can coordinate between two groups of people who otherwise would not know each other at all. They're also gatekeepers of information, right? So you can imagine how wh the actor here might say, hey, you, do you want to speak to him? Where's my commission, right? He knows, he or she knows you have to go through him or her to um, create some kind of link between two clusters. Um, so typical examples could also be entrepreneurs who usually bring together different knowledge communities together to create a product or art dealers who, whose very profession depends on the f um, is predicated on the fact that they are connected to different clusters, they know where the sellers are, they know what the buyers, who the buyers are, they know what the tastes are, and through this kind of network switching function, they can do business. Okay, this is a really quick and a little bit, and a quick, concise summary. You can read more about it, I'll, I have a bibliography at the end. But the basic conclusion, now that we've seen three examples, we've seen labor market outcomes, we've seen innovation, we've seen diamond trade. Um, let's kind of see what we have learned today. Well, the first thing obviously is that economic actors are embedded, so um, in complex non-market relationships. So when I say embedded in non-market relationships, I mean that the some, oftentimes the relationship between two actors who are engaged in some kind of transaction that relationship in itself is not just economic. It's also based on other, it can have other dimensions. They can be relatives, they can be friends, they can, you know, they might have seen each other. And also when I say that economic actors are embedded in complex non-market relationships, I also mean that um, each actor on his or her own is part of a wider network of relationships that affect his or her identity, social role, predispositions, and ultimately his or her economic behavior at the specific site of the transaction. Second conclusion is, like I, well, I guess I, I guess I said it already. It's that real-world economic behavior depends on these relationships, right? So you cannot just assume rational monad, uh, utility-maximizing actor who only cares about the transaction situation in itself. You have to think bigger. You have to think about all the relationships and how they format economic behaviors and economic processes. And the third and final thing we learned is that social network analysis is a useful conceptual tool for understanding um, how all of these things can be brought together. And you saw this with the diagrams that you know, I showed you before. 
It helps visualize what how economic processes work without recourse to kind of the, 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 the neoclassical um, models, uh, models and mathematics. Um, do we have, that's it for now. Well, he here's um, what I'll do as a kind of perk. I'll just show you like two minutes from, uh, wait, wait, no, you're not seeing this for some seconds. And so, okay. <coughs> Up. Uh. So this is the actual street where diamonds are exchanged in New York, right? This is a, from a film, New York, I Love You. She's looking at the diamonds now. He doesn't care. He's eating while she's checking his expense. Right, just a final illustration of what I'm talking about. Don't expect too many women in the actual diamond market. I think they just wanted uh, that act specific actress. Right, any questions in the time we have remaining? Yes. Uh, yeah, well, that, um, fascinating, thank you very much. Um, but I just wondered if, if uh, you know, a sort of neoclassical economist would, would say, well, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, the, the, the uh, rationality is far more complex than we might have considered. But nevertheless, you know, you might just say that the purely financial transaction is a sort of ideal type. Um, and that all the other factors, you know, family, religious considerations, for example, would um, simply complicate that would be, but it's still a rational Transaction. Yeah, so that's that's a fair point, and economics has gone in, has kind of included more and more, has expanded its basic utilitarian monad-based uh, market model of actors nowadays uh, to include these uh, other factors, and that's a very good thing. Um, I wouldn't say that the fact that relationships play a part are outside the ideal type concept of a market transaction because there are many types of economic transactions where 
which are completely non-understandable, like it is impossible to understand them if one does not take into account um, relationships and social roles. Um, and when that is the case, I think we can basically say that, you know, the ideal model, in a sense, no longer really applies because the ideal model has to somehow be a kind of re reduction to the essence of what's going on. And in the markets that I just showed you, this is not the case. Relationships are the key factor, not the kind of rational utility maximizing functions of actors. Other questions? Anyone wants to critique or say that any of the studies is wrong or something? Yeah. So in the example with the managers and relationships, mm -hmm. why was the number nine the most effective manager? Does he seem to have the most ties? Let's see. Um, he's, you mean, you mean here? Yeah. So why was nine? You mean, why was this guy? Oh, no, no, nine would be a better manager, but I just, for the, I, I, for the purpose of the exercise, I said, yes, like pick between these three, but you're right that using that model, nine would probably be the most innovative manager, right? Again, these are sort of meso level outcomes, so it's not 100% correlation, but yes, like based on that understanding of the role of relationships in the innovation process, nine, 25 would also, and 25 would be, very important actors. Um, yeah, probably the most important, these two, because they're linked to more nodes, to more clusters that are not their own. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, don't be afraid, I'm, I'm very friendly. Yeah, everything clear? Are you gonna switch subjects and do sociology now? No. <laughs> okay. Well, my email is. Uh, thank you. You have my email at, as in the beginning of this presentation, as well as a fully reference as a, a set of references. Um, I think the organizers of this lecture will make these available to you, and feel free to get in touch if you want to ask me more questions about this. Thanks. Mm -hmm.